Hey everybody, I'm Miss Cuss Pete. This is Mid Rock Crisis. Today we're going to step aside and talk about the blues, progenitor of rock music. And for today we're going to talk about Chester Burnett, also known as Chester Arthur Burnett, also known as Howlin' Wolf. He was born in Mississippi. First became a harmonica player, became a blues singer and a guitarist. Become known for his interpretations of other people's songs, especially those of Willie Dixon, and his deep growling baritone, and his height at six foot three, and his weight hovering around 300 pounds meant he was a force that could not or would not be denied. He was named after which president? Nope, not Clinton. Saxophone, no. Clinton was barely a distant twinkle in his Arkansas grandpappy's eye when Chester Arthur was born. Of course, I'm talking about Chester A. Arthur, Vermont's favorite son, but I digress. Howlin' Wolf, as he would come to be known, was first called Bigfoot Chester, and his grandpa told him that if he didn't behave, the howling wolves would get him. His early childhood with his mom, and later with his uncle, it's not what you call a storybook. There was a happy ending. He walked all the way from Mississippi to Arkansas barefoot and he found his father who took him in to his second family, which already had a bunch of young ones, and a bunch of friends he could be with, cousins, stepbrothers, brothers once removed, I don't know. Well, years later when Howlin' Wolf was at the peak of his success, he drove back to Mississippi to see his mom and give her some money. She told him, you take that devil's money and get out and don't come back. And anyone who sings the devil's music is not welcome here. Charlie Patton, perhaps the most well-known blues man in the Delta in the 30s, he taught young Chester Burnett about blues and blues music. He'd hang outside of a, the juke joint just to hear Patton sing his songs, such as Pony Boy, Spoonful, High Water Everywhere, Banty Rooster Blues. Patton taught Chester a guitar, but at least as important, Patton taught him showmanship. He was throwing his guitar around, playing it over his head, nearly 40 years before Jimi Hendrix did that. Wolf tried to imitate country singer Jimmy Rogers with his yodeling, but it came out as a growl. He learned harmonica from none other than Sonny Boy Williamson II. In 1933 in Arkansas, he gigged with Floyd Jones, Sun House, Johnny Shines, Robert Johnson, Robert Johnson, sorry, Robert Lockwood Jr., and Willie Brown. These are all blues royalty. He was in the United States Army, but not for long. <laughs> he uh, had a little problem with authority. Or a tie, you know. Yeah, the army was gearing up for World War II at that time, and they needed soldiers who did what they were ordered. So it was not a dishonorable discharge that he, Helen Wolf, received. But they had a sort of a no harm, no foul classification back then, and they gave him bus fare home, and home was still Arkansas at that time. He decided to farm, and he continued to play every Saturday night. 
1948, he and his band would play on live radio shows. In 1950, Wolf was noticed by Ike Turner, later of Ike and Tina Turner. At that time, Ike was an AR rep. Ike had no connections other than Sun Records, and he had Helen Wolf record at Sun. But Wolf wanted to record at Chess Records, so he actually went to both labels and did the same song, recorded twice. But Chess meant Chicago. And the strength of Howlin' Wolf's first single, How Many More Years, Leonard Chess offered him a contract. Then in 1952, Helen Wolf's new band with Hubert Sumlin, who stayed with Wolf until he passed. Wolf now was a full-time Chicagoan. He was well-loved by the guys in the band because he paid them well and on time. That's how he could attract the best players. Wolf has some competition at chess for Willie Dixon's songs. Muddy Waters was working concurrently. There's a story that when Wolf heard Muddy do a new Willie Dixon song, he would complain to Dixon saying, why can't you write a song like that for me? So Willie would write a song for Wolf and Wolf wouldn't like it. So Willie would start writing songs for Muddy Waters and then he'd give them to Wolf. And the songs that he wrote for Wolf went to Muddy. Wolf's first album, Moanin' in the Moonlight in 1959, is really a collection of the previous hits, the way they would do albums back then. Albums were more or less a collection of hits. They weren't LPs in their own right or concept albums or anything like that. They just raked all the hits together and put them out together. And the 60s gave us Wang Dang Doodle and the Red Rooster, later called Little Red Rooster. Killing Floor and both Brit and American groups treated Howlin' Wolf as a treasure trove. The Rolling Stones insisted that Shindig on the BBC put Wolf on. Stone's version of Little Red Rooster went to number one in 1964. I'd like to tell you a little story about that. It's about Red Rooster. Now, I don't know if I have this accurate, but we'll see. Dixon's lyrics were, quote, I got a little red rooster, too lazy to crow for days. Mick Jagger decided to change it to, I'm a little red rooster, too lazy to crow for days. And the Mick version went out just like that. And for years, and also Bobby Ware of the Grateful Dead did it mixed way as well. What I'm not sure of is if Bob or Mick really knew what the song was about. Back in the 50s and into the 60s, it became certain craft of the songwriters to alliterate about sex without actually being blunt about it. One word could even be in a code for the deed. That mustn't be mentioned in the songs or else they'd never get recorded. And Little Red Rooster is just like that. If the rooster is crowing, a man had an erection as he was in proximity to a seductive woman. If the man's rooster was lazy or too lazy to crow for days, 
meant that a man hadn't had sex for quite a while. This would make the man blue. <laughs> and Wolf knew all this terminology, but I don't think Mick gave the writers credit for sophisticated alliteration. So when Mick or anyone did the song, I'm a Little Red Rooster, it must have been hilarious to Wolf and to Willie Dixon. In effect, Mick was saying that he was a dick. And I don't think he would have said that he was a dick on a record in the early 60s. So he didn't know he was doing that. How do I know that this is true? I don't. I'm putting this out there and would love to hear your theories in the comments section. So have at it. 60s saw Wolf recording with Bo Diddley, Muddy Waters, Stevie Winwood, Eric Clapton, Bill Biden, Charlie Watts, and Ian Stewart, pianist for the Rolling Stones. The sixth stone. The new Howlin' Wolf record, like Muddy Waters' Electric Mud, was adapted to appeal to the hippie generation. whoop de doo in 1973, Backdoor Wolf was his last due to failing health. He began his music career functionally illiterate, but he wanted to read and do his own accounts so he'd keep an eye on his business associates. So he studied and he learned just as he had learned to perform. His shows were a wild spectacle. He would become so ecstatic that he actually would climb up the curtain singing his gravelly bellow and his nasal wolfman jack vocals as counterpoint he was a very large very intimidating very talented blues man and he married only once he stayed happily in love with his wife and family all through his career he had heart attacks, but would die after unsuccessful kidney surgery when he was 65. Here's a quick list of his records. 59, Moanin' in the Moonlight. 62, Howlin' Wolf Sings the Blues. 62, also Howlin' Wolf. 66, Real Folk Blues. 67, More Real Folk Blues. 69, The Howlin' Wolf Album. 69 Evil, 71 Message to the Young, 72 Chester Burnett, aka Howlin' Wolf, 72 The London Sessions, 72 Live and Cookin', 73 Backdoor Wolf, 74 London Revisited, 74 also Muddy and Wolf, and 75 Change My Way, and there were six more posthumous albums put out. Wolf would brag sometimes that he'd tell people that he was the only blues man who ever drove himself to Chicago. Since he'd already had success recording at Sun Studios in Memphis, maybe the other blues men came to Chicago on that midnight train. So understanding that our rock music is definitely influenced by the blues, as well as by gospel and by jazz. Jazz music was the only original American art form. Everything else happened elsewhere in the world first, not jazz. And now you can't really say that about blues because a lot of it came from Africa. A lot of those blues songs from the early days in the Delta left over from the time of slavery. Only a hundred years before, and with the Jim Crow situation during that time, being a successful bluesman was a lot harder than you might think. The juke joints were famous 
place where black people could go and be with themselves and not have to worry about what people thought or what white people expected of them or whatever. They would sing their hearts out. That's why blues music and the early rock and roll and R&B songs are so heartfelt and so real that today's musicians do turn back to that period for inspiration. If it weren't for blues, there'd be no rock. And if there were no rock, there'd be no East Coast Pete. <laughs> See you next time on Mid Rock Crisis. Save some rock. Look at the blues. See you next time.